and source of knowledge, evidently, in the world and all great things. Uh, it was interesting to me that they said that it's an uh, it's application of system for C++ and Python is for application general and uh, web and scripting. And it sure seems like it's a lot for a lot more than that now, but um, I would have put scientific in there or something too. And the things that I saw, the imperative, object oriented, and procedural, you know, C++ being procedural, but it's also, uh, I always saw C's being more procedural. But there is a ISO 2011 C++ update, yeah. And uh, anybody new to Python here, uh, they may not know this, but a lot of us do, that Python has an enhancement proposal process, the PEPs. So uh, there's a whole process of getting something in the language. That's pretty interesting. So I was being, was that word snarky that Carl always uses? I was, I was being a interesting uh, troll today, and I got on to Freenode, and I asked the C++ channel the exact same question as the Python channel. I said, why did you write so many classes? <laughs> They're a total pain. And literally three seconds later, I got a reply from both channels. C++ says, feel free to use a non o, -O paradigm. <laughs> or appropriate. Pure functions are oh, nice. <laughs> the Python one says, you don't have to. Play outside instead, little boy. <laughs> and in fact, they did boot me from the channel right after that. <laughs> so it's a, you know, there's certainly a different culture there. Oh, and you probably can't see this, but this, this, is, this is a uh, list comprehension to do um, some uh, access to some images in a certain order. And there's the C++ version of that same thing. Can't see it at all, I apologize for that. But Oh. Yeah, templates are involved. <laughs> so what is it? It's the lights now. Well, we'll find just like a little bit. So, um, how am I doing on time? Like Here we go. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. So, they, uh, I got two minutes left, so I have to rock and roll. So, trust in C++, they have all these methods here, you know, that to, to trust your programmer. Basically, if you're just a C++ guy, there's a guy, there's police in every corner, right? And uh, Python trust, well, you trust the module that you're, you know, you're using, your, your dependencies, so that's the trust mechanism there. Um, and uh, that's a goal I'm trying to shop. <laughs> so, features, um, you know, uh, Strauss Stort said that, you know, it's a multi-paradigm uh, language, and then I went over a paradigm back here, and I was thinking where would C++ fit in here, how functional is it, uh, how declarative and what's declarative it is. Um, when you get some time, look over this graph, I'll send it out. And um, Python does try to play nicely with C++ as well. There's a embedding here on Python, there's boost embedding, um, there's a foot from Boost, there's Swig. Um, David's not here, so I can say bad things about it. He wrote Swig, he's one of our members. And, uh, you know, and Swig would be from the other direction. So you can make something Pythonized that is C already. And, and C that's, that's a little untrue in some ways. Look, these are just function pointers, they're C pointers. They're pumps, right? So <laughs> you can't really use it uh, as C very easily, you can do some class stuff. It is a little tricky this way, but you can get it for it. So, you know, I'm not gonna go and dedicate the rest of my life writing C++. That's my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm talking about common list because it's the best language ever. Uh, but instead of actually talking about common list, I'm gonna actually explain lists in general and then explain why. If you are interested in the language, I highly endorse you start here with monkeymonkeys.com slash book. You go to the next book, it's all online. That's awesome. So, I, if you've been on the internet longer than a day, you've probably heard of FizzBuzz. FizzBuzz is a simple program you're supposed to, uh, programming center you're supposed to give new programming uh, <coughs> interviews where you go uh, write a program, goes from numbers 1 to 100, and every multiple of 3 prints Fizz, and every multiple of five prints buzz, and then for both you do fizz buzz. And you go on Stack Overflow because you don't know how to write fizz buzz. You say, how do I write fizz buzz in Python? And you get something that looks like this. Which is not nearly as cool as some of the ones that you see on there, which use list comprehensions and whatnot. But the interesting thing about this um, is pretty much nothing. However, when you take a language 
um, any syntax, any syntax from any language, the first thing you're going to want to do is pass it through a parser, and you're going to get an abstract syntax tree. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, the first symbol, the top of our syntax tree for this is the symbol 4n, and 4n is going to have three subnodes. One is going to be x, that's the variable we're going to be finding. One's going to be range 100, and the next one's going to be the if statement, the starting of a block. That if statement is going to have a check, and then it's going to have a block, and then it's going to have an elif as a third argument, and that's going to have a check, and so on and so forth. And you can see clearly how the Python gets translated to an abstract syntax tree very easily. Now the thing about abstract syntax trees, which is really, really neat, is that every tree can be represented just as a list. Um, where the first node in your, or the first element in your list is the node, the root node, and then every element coming after is subnodes. So in this one you can think there's a list that exists called foreign, and the first, first element of that list, or the second element of that list is x, and the third one is a sublist that is range 100, and the fourth one is a giant sublist. And what you can do with an abstract syntax tree, you kind of visualize this, is you can replace all of those lines with blocks. And you can see how the syntax tree builds from there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a magic trick, and I'm going to say I'm going to take this, I'm going to rotate it, <coughs> then I'm going to move all the horizontal lines, then I'm going to move all the lines on the left up, and all the lines on the right down, then I'm going to bend all the lines. <laughs> and if anybody's ever looked at Lisp, of course that looks horribly, horribly familiar. But the interesting thing when you start using any Lisp, you no longer see the curly, you see this. And that's, that's something interesting that happens to your mind the more and more you look at it because the, the flow of the code makes it so you only see the groupings. You no longer see all the, the fingernails, as you know, Larry Wall says. So interestingly enough, here's the two examples. And they look kind of similar, but which one is easier to read? And it is obvious that the one in Python is easier to read. Syntax helps our eyes so much to be able to intuit the meaning of code. However, if you wanted to write a program to generate one of these, obviously the one on bottom is easier. If you wanted to write a program to interrogate one of them, obviously the one on the bottom is probably easier. If you wanted to say, what is the name of the variable of the for in statement? In the top one, you have to go and do some string searching, which may or may not work. On the bottom one, you say, give me the second element of the top tree. That's it. Very easy to do. To give you more of an example, we're going to talk about list comprehensions because I think everyone should talk about list comprehensions. We've got two for two here. This is the list comprehensions in the manual for Python on python.org <laughs> to explain them. Um, and to talk about them a little bit, I'm going to explain how the Lisp interpreter works. The Lisp interpreter works by having a read about print loop from the inside out. You read in a string and you convert it to a list. You evaluate the list and that returns some kind of an object, some kind of a thing, some kind of an answer. Then you print out the answer and you loop. Lisp allows you to interject a little bit of code between reading the string and evaluating it. It allows you, gives you that syntax tree and it allows you to mutate it in some way. How much time do I have left? One minute. Oh, great. So, if we wanted to change. 14 the, seconds, sorry. What? 14 seconds. <laughs> Did I have another minute? No. Really? Oh. Aw. Well, you guys don't get to learn how to write list comprehensions in common list. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about Rust, which is a systems programming language from uh, Mozilla. We might be the, this might be the newest language at this uh, programming language shootout. Um, so I was thinking, what does it actually mean to be a systems programming language? Um, I guess sort of the technical definition is maybe you're going to write a kernel in it or an operating system. Uh, maybe you're going to write a web server or uh, a web browser. I don't know. Um, I think Python is probably a pretty good systems programming language for things like writing a web server. Uh, but we need new stuff. Uh, we do have some systems programming languages right now. Uh, of course, we have C, which this is uh, this is Dennis Ritchie's head on Mies van der Rohe's 
body. <laughs> so C is sort of like this less is more approach, right? And C is great. I really like programming in C. And then uh, we also have C++. <laughs> so that's, there's that. Um, but we need some new stuff. Uh, and Rust is sort of a, again, like C++, it's a multi-paradigm language. But it really has an emphasis on uh, safety and uh, not making, you know, you know, not deallocating memory they're not supposed to be deallocating and these sorts of things. Um, this is their hello world example. Uh, it shows that you know they do like sort of the functional paradigm as well. Uh, this little i thing is uh, is, a, is an anonymous function, uh, and this is iterating over everything in the vector one two three and printing it out. Um, and Rust is a compiled language, uh, so you know you compile it just like C or C plus um, plus. It's statically typed. One of the interesting things that it has is this idea of something that's called type state. Um, it's not a terribly new idea, but there aren't many programming languages that take advantage of this. And the idea of type state is that in addition to the types of a language, the types of variables that you're tracking, you're also tracking the states of those variables. Uh, so in this example right here, I have um, a variable called hi, and I'm declaring it to have type string, but I'm not initializing it, and then I'm trying to print it out. So with type state, the compiler itself is tracking the states of of the variables, so it knows that hi is in the uninitialized state. So this example won't even compile, um, and it fails with a message, you know, that sort of looks like this. I, I took some stuff out. Um, again, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> the the error messages, me, me, messages are actually kind of kind of good. I mean, they're you know they're not as good as C plus plus. You don't get 500 pages of output, but. Um, uh, but but again, you know, the language has only been around for for two or three years, so uh, so that's that. And then uh, again, with type state, it's not just limited to local variables. Um, you know, if you have an enum or a record type, it's going to make sure that you're not accessing the things in there um, that that haven't been initialized either. Uh, another design uh, decision with Rust is that working with C code is really really simple. Um, so enums and records are represented in memory just like they're represented in C. So you can, if you're calling into uh, a C function that takes a record, you can just declare that record in Rust. Uh, and then down here on the bottom, I, here's an example uh, from somebody's GitHub account of uh, interacting with the SQL, uh, SQLite 3 library. Um, and basically you just declare in this native block, this is sort of, this is sort of functioning as the header that you would have in C. Um, and then you, you link against it, and uh, you basically run your code. Um, so one, one of the things, I'm sorry, one minute? All right, sweet. Um, I'll make fun of node.js now. Uh, <laughs> uh, here's the Fibonacci thing, which is the, you know, the best example of uh, concurrency in the universe. Uh, <laughs> and Rust has pretty good concurrency mechanisms too. It looks just like it just look, looks just like um, Erlang. Uh, it's, a, it's an actor system. There's lots of other really great stuff. There actually is generic programming on like Go. There's a lot of type inference. Um, there's different types of closures. Some closures are on the stack, and some closures are on the heap. Um, and there's also ideas of different pointers. Uh, so there's safe pointers and unsafe pointers, and pointers that that um, can be shared, but can't be shared across tasks. And there's also a fairly good tool chain, so there's documentation, testing, logging, uh, you have an Emacs plugin. And again, it's really new, so you should go to rustlang.org and contribute. You'll probably not write your production system in it. <laughs> so, um, Point it at your chin, not your mouth. Okay. It just I'll sucks. <laughs> it just sucks. Uh, I'll keep it down a little bit. How about that? It, That's it, good. So, Node is kind of like a hot and uh, hip thing right now. And I don't really know why. I don't actually use it myself. So, I, was, I find it kind of interesting, though. So, I'm going to talk about the interesting things. And then talk about why you should use Python. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm talking about Node, right? But Node's not really a language, it's, it's JavaScript. Right. Um, JavaScript or, or Node is really just server-side JavaScript. That's it. It's not even cool JavaScript like uh, Firefox. So 
support you know, array comprehensions and generators. Node doesn't even support any of that because it's based on the more kind of conservative JavaScript. So it's pretty close to what's in the browser. It's not broken like IE JavaScript, but it's pretty conservative. So I'm just going to jump into some things that make Node pretty cool, unlike client-side JavaScript. So it has a really neat packaging system. Uh, this is pretty familiar if you are if you build like setup.py stuff in your, in your packages. So you just have a package.json file. You put it in your directory that you want to create a Node module with. They call JavaScript files modules, and so um, if you imagine that you have your module.js, you can put this package file in there, and then you can say that you have some dependencies. You can say that you depend on the HTTP module, and that's at a very specific version. It's 0.1. That's the one that you, you uh, require. You could also use you know, greater than equals if you wanted to. Also threw in, uh, just for example, that you depend on Express, which is a web framework. So what happens is you can say npm install, which is really similar to pip install, and what it'll do is, let's say you have your lib directory, and that's where your module lives, and then you have your package.json file, and npm install will create this node underscore modules directory right there uh, in, in, your, in your local directory, so it's not global. It'll install all, the, all your dependencies local. It won't pollute the global uh, node, node space in your, in your machine. What's really cool is, well, you'll see in there, so HTTP is one of the requirements, right? So it has a model for that, and it has Express in there. And so what's really cool is if Express depends on another version of HTTP, like it depends on 0.2 or something like that, it can get its own version of HTTP and will not conflict with your version. So this is not even possible in Python. Setup tools tried to do it, but there was so much magic that it never worked. And, and people hated setup tools, and then they started using pip because they didn't know pip was just a wrapper around setup tools without magic. <laughs> <laughs> but this, you, you do this in Node. And so this is sort of what the uh, require statements look like. It's similar to import. So you <coughs> require a module, and then you get it. And that gets your local module. You can also, at the bottom there, you'll see uh, uh, .slash logger.js. You can also just require regular files if they're in your root somewhere. So there's a magic variable called exports that you get in every node module. And the first thing I should mention is that unlike client-side JavaScript, there are no globals. So when you make var special, if you were to do this in like client-side JavaScript, it would be global, it would be attached to the window object, it could possibly conflict with all other scripts that you have loaded on that page. So you can't do that in Node. Var special is private to your module. And so there's this magical exports variable, and when you assign things to that, then those become visible on the module itself. So exports.login creates a login property, and if you use um, this code somewhere else, right, you, you require auth.js, then you can call auth.login. So seconds. you can't call auth.special. 40 seconds. OK, let's get that. So people like to share JavaScript between client side. There's a way to do it. This is boilerplate, but it's not a big deal. What's really cool about Node is that people got really excited about it, and they started building all these cool things. Because in, in client side JavaScript, there's no I/O. You can't, you know, you know, have read files or, or database stuff. So people just went nuts, and they built all this async code. And so there's like this whole base library of asynchronous code, and that's one thing that makes Node pretty interesting because there's all these libraries and you don't have to block on I.O. You can do some function and it'll come back. You don't have to use Twisted. And it has a JIT. JavaScript has a JIT. Yes! Good job. Good job. That's awesome. Thank you. All right, I'm Colin. Uh, Mike. I'm talk about Clojure a little bit. Mike. Uh, so Clojure is a Lisp. Uh, it's a Lisp on the JVM that takes as a core principle uh, the idea of immutability by default. So first of all, Lisp, we've already seen a little bit of We've already seen a little bit of Lisp tonight, but um, <coughs> take a look at this. A print scary. Uh, Pythonistas, I think, should say that no, they're not like syntax is just sort of this uh, thing on top, right? So some arbitrary external view of the syntax is not going to be that important, right? You spend three days on the language, you're, it's, you're going to start ignoring it, right? Not a big deal. So just to go in parentheses, as Frank pointed out. 
so first class functions are important to this, right? Uh, we've got this idea that we can uh, take, we can have functions that take functions as values, as arguments. Um, we can also create functions as first class values um, and use those functions to do things, right? It's pretty easy to make an adder function, for instance. Uh, macro is another important feature of Lisp, right? We can create code that looks pretty much like language features. Uh, we can rewrite things, uh, move duplication in a way that a lot of other languages isn't going to be able to allow you to do. Right, so this code right here is going to give you a locking mechanism so that you don't have to uh, manage the locking and unlocking and the try, finally, this is, if you're living in Java land or any sort of concurrency land, this should be familiar to you. Uh, you don't want to have to rewrite that code over and over and over. But it's not easy to build in as part of language if you don't have something like that. It's also a hosted language, right? JVM. So JVM's a really well-researched and tuned uh, virtual machine. Uh, it's got some pretty awesome garbage collection, JIT, uh, you know, security mechanisms. Uh, there's a ton of libraries uh, that you have direct and easy access to in, in Clojure. Right, so we're calling class methods here, we're calling uh, constructors, instance methods. Um, and it's super, super easy to do. And you don't need to rely on wrappers. You don't have to write your own wrappers for all this stuff, right? Direct access, just as fast as Java to do a lot of these things. Um, and in addition, like when, you, when it comes time to ship, you can just ship a jar file, right? Just like Java, your your uh, your release engineering team doesn't have to worry about you know providing this whole new uh, environment for you. you. Just ship a jar file and use all your JMX tools, whatever you want in Java. Uh, there's also a bunch of other hosts, right? So it's a hosted language, not just the JVM. Uh, there's a pretty much um, Pretty faithful reinterpretation of it in .NET and David Miller's done. Uh, there are versions on JavaScript and C, a new one uh, in C via Gambit. Um, and even one on Python, Pusher Pi. Uh, has anybody seen this? Play around with it. Pretty sweet looking stuff, but it's very experimental. It's not like ready for the big things like JVM version of the But a pretty awesome idea. Um, and immutability by default. Uh, this is one of, one of Clojure's really core cool principles, one of the big ideas that has gotten Clojure sort of onto the main stage. Um, has anybody done concurrency with shared mutable state in the room, right? Have you ever felt like this? It's painful, right? Uh, so I, 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 I tend to think that the, the Ruby and the Python uh, approaches this are, are go processes, go fork exec, right? That's, that's really a legitimate way to do things, but it does add a little bit of overhead and it adds a little bit of complexity to code, right? You've got to do inter process communication. Um, things get a little trickier. Um, but uh, immutability um, with um, concurrency becomes way, way easier. Um, and it's not just concurrency that, that immutability uh, makes it easier, it's also single thread reasoning, right? So in Python, if you have. Uh, it's right here, let's do a once before, and you call do something on it. Uh, what's, what, what's the value of x going to be at the end of this? Might be what, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, might be something else, right? This, this do something function may have replaced things in the middle, and it's even worse than that, right? Because if you consider that these don't have any numbers, if they're arbitrary things, um, the, the system, the, the do something function could ch make changes to arbitrary things in the middle of this, right? Um, but in closure, uh, by default, Pretty much everything is immutable, right? So the sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 um, is an unchanging thing. You're going to have that same view, identity, and state and value. Those are all the same thing. 30 seconds. Cool. Right, so you don't have this problem anymore. You know after you call do something exactly what R is. Still efficient. You don't have to copy everything. There, are, there is copying involved, but this paper is awesome. This is basically the core of closures immutable data structures. And um, there are also ways to do control mutation in a safe way. Uh, there's some other really cool language features. My favorite is polymorphism on the cut. Um, and there's some really cool sequence abstraction things in Clojure as well, which you can look into. And I'd be happy to talk with you after we're done. That's all I got. Yeah, small problem itself with this, because it kind of makes this kind of, kind of ripping and tearing completely effortless. So why the lucky step has played with a lot of languages, like I have, and I think IO is awesome, so it is B. Uh, you guys probably have seen the book, uh, Seven Languages, Seven Weeks. It's uh, just to cover seven languages, of, of, one of, it, of which is IO. 
And Bruce does this weird thing where it like gives assigns each language like a movie star personality, a movie character personality. For some reason, he thinks IO is like the equivalent of Ferris Bueller. So I'll leave you to touch on that tonight. Your work ideas. So the thing with IO is that it's really simple. That it actually has no keywords whatsoever. The type of languages we think are simple, IO is even more simple. So I want to talk a little bit about how what IO has in common with Python. So it has these simple rules, and we don't tend to put like crazy little punctuation in front of our variables or other types of decoration like that. Uh, very little sugar. What the code you're looking at is probably code you mean. And what I like to call philosophical intestinal fortitude. That is, both languages have a manifesto, an idea of looking at the world, and and throughout the language they adhere to that manifesto. So let me walk you through some IO basics. So the first thing is, IO is really small from a bunch of different perspectives. The VM itself is about 10k lines of code, which is pretty small for any you know, VM with a bunch of garbage collector and a bunch of goodies. Uh, the language itself is small, with very few simple syntax rules. Um, it's embeddable, embeddable, much like uh, the type of things you might embed Lua into. Uh, IO is also a great choice for that. And so IO is, uh, I just looked it up, and uh, it turns out to be 10 years old this year. And for those wondering what you should get IO, it turns out to be 10. 10 is the material 10 years anniversary. <laughs> So IO is dynamically typed, much like Python, no biggie there. And I want to walk you through a little bit of how to write IO. So you download it, and here's uh, type IO in the command line, and you get the prompt. And I just can do a little string there, you have string literals, and I'm sending the string literal, the print the message, and I get the little hello world. And it doesn't have statements, everything is an expression, so we also get back the hello world string. So IO is also object oriented, not in the evil C++ meaning of the term, more in the good small talk uh, style message passing meaning of the term. And IO is prototypical, so this is where it veers away from small talk. So instead of thinking, well, I have this class, you get these classes like templates, and instead of saying, you know, car new, or I put the uh, new gray right here, because if you're a Python or JavaScript guy, you just can't ignore the new and just call it the uh, constructor like a function. Um, you, you clone things. So in classical inheritance, you can have a chain like this where every object has basically a pointer to what class it represents. And those individual classes have basically pointers up along to what it represents, usually up to some root class. Well, for a typical inheritance, Actually, you get rid of the idea of classes altogether. It turns out you don't really need them. Just let it go, man. And uh, <clears throat> so you can see that these methods, you have much along the same chain, but these are all prototypes. And so when you invoke a method, for example, if you want to open the doors on my car, it just follows the chain up of all these instances. So every object just has basically a list of prototypes. So this is like JavaScript, that's also a prototype-based language, but I will extend it that you can have multiple prototypes, and that just adds to the chain. And so prototypes are really cool that I purposely supplied that chart. It turns out that there's all those methods you saw were instance methods. And it turns out that we also have class methods, the class variables, and where do they live? And so a small, here's an example I saw from Wikipedia about Smalltalk 8 and its involved class system. It turns out what inherits what's and what's a meta class and what's a class description, and then they have these like, whole behaviors. I don't even understand. 30 seconds. Wow. OK, so here's, let's walk, let me walk you through this. I create a vehicle, I create a car, I create a vehicle class, I create a car class, I clone the car, I send it the foo message, it does not respond to it, I add it to the vehicle object, and now a car to respond to the foo. Lightweight proteins, go through that. Very cool is that we have actor based concurrency, that the type of asynchronous behavior of um, so basically, sending and putting an at message in front of any message makes it asynchronous. And we give you back to the future. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so copy script is uh, on deck. He's here, I saw. So. And extra, extra pluses. Uh, 
borrow a computer from someone who can see the internet. Can, the internet? can, they, can anyone loan their computer? Get their computer? Uh, uh, <laughs> so has everybody seen that voting form? Because here in five or six more form we're talking about. So I guess because I know the show. We're going to be voting. So you might want to just familiarize yourself with the process. Maybe. If it doesn't work, then that's a problem too. It's on the website. I sent it to the list. So. Um, yeah, it's by language name. Okay, so not in order, but it's on order the list. <laughs> so that's the one thing. We're gonna give him a couple minutes because this is not his computer. Okay. So it's, uh, yeah, so is anybody here never uh, is yeah. brought here and <laughs> hates Python? I can't really take the uh, <laughs> So what do you, what do you guys think of this? Is this cool? It's more exciting than long talks. Yeah, plus one for lightning talks. Lightning talks are crazy. Time. I know. Plus, it's good if you're ADD. Where are we going after this? Uh, wait, are you talking about? Uh, Bar? Pub? Yeah, there's a pub called New Line that's a couple blocks yeah, yeah, yeah. north. Right underneath, right by the, right underneath yeah, the uh, Clinton L line. Yeah, New Line's cool. Yeah, okay. Oh
anyway, so Phil, you ready? We had some technical difficulties because, you know, we don't play anybody. Anyway, uh, you ready? I think so. Okay, go. Okay, I'm going to talk about Fortran 4 today. Woohoo! But unlike other people who have uh, websites and code examples, I'm not actually going to show you any of those because I really don't think you want to program in Fortran 4. <laughs> <laughs> Not unless you're uh, working out at, on the blue jean machine, trying to do some super distributed stuff which has to compile to very tiny source code. That's the only reason to use Fortran. But it's a very interesting language because it's where our languages came from. So I'm going to talk about the history, something about what the language looks like, and uh, if I have any time, advanced concepts in the program. So the history. It was developed in the late 1950s by people working at IBM. It ran on machines that were big, but the environments were tiny by today's standards. 16 to 64K, 2 megahertz clock cycle, very simple instruction sets. And by 1962, we had four languages with big futures, Fortran, COBOL, ALGOL 60, and LISP. Fortran was known as the scientific programming language. If computation was important, this is the one you used. It had subroutines which you could pass parameters to. It was still important by the, up until the early 80s when C came in and took over most of the uses for Fortran. COBOL was the business programming language. Uh, the only reason I can think that it was a business programming language was that the record structures were built into the language. Otherwise, I'd consider COBOL a horrible language. <laughs> <laughs> ALGOL 60 was an academic language, meaning that it was used by the computer science community. It was the first language to have block structures built in, begin and end. Uh, for a while, quite a while, if you wanted to publish an algorithm, your code had to be in, Al in ALGOL 60. LISP was the math and artificial intelligence language. It looks today a lot like it did then. Uh, you take an idea, wrap parentheses around it, and the LISP people will claim that it was always there in LISP. However, Fortran. Fortran program, first thing you had was the memory usage statements, followed by the main routine, subroutines, and then your input data. This was very card oriented. I don't know if all of you have seen cards. This is what a deck of cards looked like. It had 80 columns. <coughs> so the Fortran statement was designed. or a punch card. It was column oriented. The first five characters were your label. The next, char next column was a continuation. You had multiple continuations. You could punch them one, two, three, four, but anything in that line counted as a continuation from the line before. The next uh, seven to column seven through 72 were your statement. There was only one statement per line. There was no need to have a semicolon or any other thing to indicate the end of line. One minute. Because it was the end of the line. <laughs> and the last few codes were, columns were for uh, punching a sequencing number, so if you dropped your deck, you could put it back into order. <laughs> <laughs> Memory. Uh, Fortran supported a very simple set, Fortran 4 supported a very simple set of memory. The character, the integer, and the float. Character was a byte, integer was four bytes, float was eight bytes, and you could have arrays of the above. You didn't even have strings. Strings were just an array of car. <laughs> you could have various statements. Let's see, A equals B plus C. This is something that is continued in all languages. We still have it in Python. There's my Python reference. 
<laughs> if condition, you could have a statement. Remember, statements were very simple. stupid to work at McDonald's. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it up to you to decide <laughs> afterwards, but you're welcome, Peter. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I subsequently got out of the business. Uh, all right, anyway, my name is Pete Fine. I um, have written mostly Python the last decade, and CoffeeScript, which I'm going to talk about today, is the first language I've been excited about in about 10 years. Um, this uh, talk is actually written in CoffeeScript, by which I mean I wrote a little bit of code and ripped off large parts of it. Um, what is CoffeeScript? Uh, alternate syntax for JavaScript, uh, inspired by Python and Ruby and Lisp a little bit. And if you're thinking at this point Google Web Toolkit or something that is another language that compiles into JavaScript, just stop. It's just JavaScript, okay? So given that, why should you use it? Um, and my answer is because JavaScript is ugly. I mean, look at this. This is like 90s stuff here, all right? It's 2012. Let's get beyond it. Um, so no, really. Um, it's got indentation for white space like Python. Um, it, all those stupid things that we have JSLint for, like you forgot your bar or you used two equal signs instead of three, like CoffeeScript, like just in the language, deals with that. No problem. Um, it's got all those modern things you would expect, like variable arguments and comprehensions and areas, blah. Uh, it runs in your browser. Also, it's just JavaScript, which means your friends and coworkers won't murder you if you use it. Um, and it looks like this. Right. It's got assignments and conditionals, which are in some ways subtly different than the Python ternary operator, which is really frustrating. Um, <laughs> It's got a raise. Uh, you don't have to. Um, it's got a really nice syntax for JavaScript objects. It's got actually two or three kind of different variants that are really friendly. Um, we'll talk more about the function syntax in a bit. Um, stuff like that, comprehensions, all that good stuff. Okay. So, oops, forgot to put this out. So we said it's just JavaScript, right? All right, this is just running in your plain old browser. There's no print function, so maybe we should write one. Now, functions are a little weird, because they're just, by default, anonymous, right? So. And so we've got to give this thing a name if we want to actually use it. This comes really handy, like when you're writing callbacks. Because you can just splat these things in all over the place. Print, microsoft. Oh, do I have a problem? Oh, it's so nice. Huh. Ah, there. All right, so it prints. Um, any functions we should write? It's good. Fibonacci, let's see if I can remember how to do that. And so what actually you can see on the right is what's doing in the browser is there's an interpreter, a translator, is probably a better way to put it, uh, that's translating in the browser, written in JavaScript, and this is the corresponding JavaScript uh, that this CoffeeScript translates to. Uh, gosh. Zero. Um, the neat thing is that the last one minute. thing. One minute. Okay. Um, so 
you don't even need the return, just the last value. We'll do what you want. Alright, we'll return the last value of your combination. That was the warning. That was the warning. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can show you some more code. Um, so this is what a sum function looks like. So, uh, really, that's a lot cleaner than that equivalent JavaScript. Over here on this right. So, in conclusion, CoffeeScript is awesome, and you should throw all of your JavaScript right now. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You can find a copy spot. Right sorry, Evil Joel. My next now? Yeah. I didn't really give you much warning, sorry. You are already out of time. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something you already know anyway. So. so ActionScript 3 and Scala is not here, right? ActionScript 3 or Scala? So Go is the last one after this on deck. Wow, he just did in time. It. He did it like just now. That's <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Download, but it really doesn't. I looked it up, and it also downloaded just from HTTP. 
Curl, um, <laughs> on the other hand, you download from an HTTPS site, which I, I plus good for them. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, huge cult, there's a huge library, standard library in Java. You get collections, of three I think three D comes right with it. Um, Swing, which is like your GUI stuff, uh, security, uh, your file stuff, your you have, you have parsing built in. If you guys look at like a C, like a standard library, it's like tiny. There's nothing in it. Like if you try to, do it, if you're in like a programming contest or something like that, you can't, you just can't use it. There's nothing there. Um, C++ is a little better, but still, like, you have to use Boost or something like that. Java's got it all built in, and um, that's, I think it's a real advantage. Um, let's see, uh, there's serverless support, which is the web stuff. Um, XML parsers, but tons of parsers. So let's see, you got uh, excellent, there's also excellent like third party libraries. You know Apache is not just like a web server. It, like there's there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can download from this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of it's Java libraries. Um, you got also stuff like Spring and Hibernate. Great, great libraries, third party library support. Um, let's see here. Uh, great compatibility, it's on Windows, Mac, Linux. It's also on these weird things like ZOS or AIX, stuff you probably don't use at home. One minute. Um, you, if, you, if you want to use Android, you need to know Java. Uh, just, or it's not, like you're telling me it's not actually Java because it changed the language features or something Why like that. Why so They're probably going to rename it at some point. Uh, it could be like Java 2 or, I don't know. Um, okay, so great IDEs, Eclipse, NetBeans, uh, you can use those with other things as well. Uh, strong documentation, there's a Java docs, it's a great standard format. Um, great backwards compatibility, uh, like they never change, they never break any of their thing in the prior versions, which is terrible in my opinion, but it's great if you want backwards compatibility. Um, and uh, I'm like Python for three, they broke a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about the rest of this. Well, we have a package naming system, a jar of water system, so like you can, um, it's easy to import stuff. It's easy to bundle things. Uh, great job security. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. Uh, remember, remember job. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Go, or as we call it on the internet, Go Lang, which has just been. Uh, uh, observed trying to research information about Go just by using the word Go on Google. Not so easy. Uh, so this is Hello World in Go. Uh, one of the first things you'll notice is we have uh, um, namespaces, which is in Python we know is a great, uh, great Hawken idea. We should use more of them. Uh, and uh, that's declaring fun. Well, no, no, but a couple of things you uh, notice is that uh, um, it's uh, also Unicode aware, which is uh, which is great, especially in today's day and age. Uh, so, uh, Go is a, uh, um, partly a response to C. It's a systems language, and whenever I hear systems language, I immediately think pointers, but I also, uh, I also think uh, um, somebody's talking about C or C++. So this is called the reverse spiral notation for how to interpret a, uh, how to read a C expression, where that's a, you know, uh, it's a pointer to an array of chars, size 10. Uh, you know, that's easy, right? But uh, here's how it could be, and this is how it is in Go, where uh, um, the top is the uh, kind of more verbose way to do it. Uh, go, you declare your uh, variable and then the type, so it reads left to right, very natural for a human reader. Uh, the second notation uses type inference. The colon equals operator allows, or you know, tells the uh, uh, Go compiler, look what's on the right, and just assign that type to the, uh, to the, to the variable on the left. Uh, now in C, how would we add functions to data? Like we're used to, we're, we're used to object oriented programming or functional programming, but uh, um, a lot of times you still want to attach uh, functions to data, or you want to keep your functions close to your data uh, so that your program is easier to understand and uh, easier to reason about. Well, here's how. Here's one way you would do it in C. Copy from Stack Overflow. I'm not, uh, I'm not a great C hacker, so if there's an error in here, I'm not going to know about it. Uh, but uh, um, uh, you have a lot of function pointers, uh, instruct, type def. Oh, by the way, the name of your type goes all the way down to the bottom. And don't forget that fucking semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
So how do I add functions to my data in Go? Uh, this is going to look a little more similar, uh, or at least familiar, to uh, Python programmers, in which case uh, you're going to declare a struct at the top, which is going to hold your data. But then uh, uh, you can declare functions uh, on structs, or actually anything. That, like, uh, um, uh, any data type you declare, like string or int, you can assign functions to. Uh, so, for example, you can add a function to a string in your program if you want. And it's only, it's only valid in your package, so it's not like Ruby where, where uh, it affects every instance of array. But uh, in this case, just for your type points or, uh, or a type you declare in your package, uh, self will be familiar to uh, Python programmers, and not just the name I chose because, because uh, I know my audience. But uh, that could be, that, you know, the variable could be anything. But the, but the main idea here is that, to me at least, is a lot easier to read, it's a lot easier to reason about, it's a lot easier to create uh, functions on uh, the works on data in a, in a cohesive and sensible way. Now, also when you're talking about C and C++, you gotta worry about concurrency. Uh, we've got multiple cores, uh, more cores every year, and how do you do that in C? Well, you import p threads and they run for your lives, because you're gonna have to lock, uh, you're gonna have to know how to organize your locks, you're gonna, need to look, you're gonna need to know where to put your locks, you're gonna need to communicate with the rest of your team to lock and unlock your data in the correct order. You have to have a locking strategy. Uh, I don't know, sorry, you're on a joke there. But uh, um, how would I do it in Go? Uh, Go has uh, um, uh, concurrency primitives built in, it's called a Go routine, or at least they call it a Go routine. And uh, a Go routine is a very lightweight process. Uh, think of like uh, Erlang uh, processes. It's it's more synonymous uh, to uh, Erlang process than a full-on uh, uh, POSIX thread. Now, uh, Go routines are multiplexed on POSIX threads. That's an implementation detail that they that they cover up for you. But uh, but this is really a nice convenience. But uh, Go list that sort that assumes that's happening somewhere in your function body. Um, but anyway, that's the way. That's the way, that's way you're using dealing with anything involving p-threads, at least in my opinion. Uh, now, if you've got many uh, processes running and working on it for me and, and doing useful work for you, you're often going to want to coordinate between them, and uh, Go does that via channels. Uh, if you've ever read... Oh, well then, there you go. I was done anyway. Boom! <laughs>